and a revelry, revelry to all of you. Happy holidays. Hoping you're giving thanks for uh, for us because we're giving thanks to you. It's morning combat coming at you. It is Friday. Uh, let me get the date right. November 27th, 2020. No, we're not recording this on a Friday, full disclosure. But that's when you're receiving it. Black Friday, indeed. So hopefully uh, you're, you're, you know, your punch defense was good out there at Kmart this morning. My name is Brian Campbell, the big beige one. One half of your MK duo. The other fella on the other side, uh, you know him. He's the best. He's the best thing going today, guys, at CBS Sports MMA <laughs> Beyond. He's got like a million YouTube followers. He lifts weights in his front yard. It is Luke Thomas. Luke, uh, you haven't had Thanksgiving yet, but uh, hope you had a good one, Luke. Yes, this is from the future, and um, I don't know what happened on Thursday, but I can say it was probably great. Happy Thanksgiving right. to you, BC. So hopefully no Colombians caught COVID. Happy holidays to everybody this week, and hopefully everybody out there is doing a few things. Number one, liking this special edition holiday treat video for you. Number two, subscribing to this podcast. We're like 69,000 strong, but we're trying to get up to 75, 100. Get Luke's top off. Get a lot of fun things going on if we can get up there. And number three, I hope you clicked yes. Play. I hope you press play on the MK documentary this week, the studio return, the documentary. Shout out to the folks at Malka and Showtime for producing that. Uh, Luke, let's not go any further than that before we do what this show is all about, which is answering the questions from our viewers, from our listeners, all that. Uh, your thoughts on this production hitting the streets, bro? The the documentary? Yeah. People seem to like it, dude. People seem to like it. You and I were a little bit bickericious towards the end of it but uh all in good fun and we were both hung over and tired and that's okay uh in general i th i i think it was a hit dude don't you yeah i mean i'm very impressed by uh you know less than jake our, our fine former mk cameraman and apparently he was the chief editor on this for malka but they took mm -hmm. luke uh an inside look at how the mk sausage is made some of the bubbling difficulties and tensions going on between you and i between jay aaron the uh the producer the great producer well the producer and uh <laughs> you know and they and they mushroom them they brought them to the surface luke but no no worries if you're a viewer luke and i not getting divorced or fired yet eventually but not yet yes we were we are definitely going to go down in flames but not anytime soon yeah, indeed. So, uh, look, this is the purpose of this show, to give you a little bonus on this holiday weekend, not just MK all day, nearly every day, not just the fun extra interviews you got from Francis Ngannou to Errol Spence, Danny Garcia, a lot more to come next week. Uh, what we did, of course, was command you to head on over to Apple Podcasts, boost our rating there, and really just asking your questions. You ask it, we'll answer it on this Black Friday. Luke, white people are just as willing to wait in line at three in the morning and getting to fisticuffs, pushing the door open at Best Buy to get that damn projector screen as any other minority. Why are we calling it Black Friday? I don't know why we call it. Well, I don't think they ever called it Black Friday because that's who the racial component was of people taking advantage of the deals. It probably had some other component. But I will say that there's been... People try to shame you if you watch Black Friday fight videos, and it turns out that like millennials and Gen Z are much more likely of all demographic groups to be involved in those deals, right? Like if you actually, what's the what's the demographic makeup of your typical Black Friday shopper? Hey man, spans spans the demos: white, black, male, female, rich, poor, somewhere in the middle, young, old, right? It's a nice little mix. I take no shame, BC, in watching two mothers fucking hammer each other over a toaster <laughs> at Target at 7 in the morning. I love it. You know what I do to take shame with? And look, for some people, this is their, their holiday week. This is their Thanksgiving weekend goal. For me and my family, Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, you know what we do? We put up the Christmas tree. We put up the decorations. We play the music. I, you know, My wife and kids, would be they'd be willing to start Christmas season in like July if I didn't step in and say, we must respect the best holiday ever, Thanksgiving first. But the second it's over, Luke, it's it's Christmas Village. It's the whole thing. I, I get that for some people, and maybe to them it's a family thing too. Shopping, getting a great deal all day in lines. To them, that's holidays. To me, that's – I mean, Luke, I, I've – you know what's worse than people that, that watch 
fight uh black friday fight videos people that wait in line for black friday like i'm not against getting a deal i've gone out at 2 p.m on a black friday and checked out best Buy and said hey anything cool here for cheap but i ain't get dude i ain't sacrificing family time for uh for a new xbox come on bro no no yeah i mean i'm definitely a low life for watching those videos i certainly acknowledge but am i really as bad as the person who camped out to get a ps5 in front of circuit city i, I don't think that i am but look, we all do our own weird stuff. So if that's how you get high, yeah. then then stay there. All right. The goal of this show, of course, and uh, thank you for everything you support. These are one of the times we get to give back to you, not just the documentary. This fun episode, answer your questions. Maybe have a little holiday fun here, uh, aside from the typical fight game cycle. So, Luke, why don't we kick it off? These are from the people. Now, we don't have names. You know that gets me mad because I like to recognize our, our listeners, our viewers. You're more like, no, don't give them any reason to sue us. But uh, let's start off right here from one of our viewers. Luke, I'll pitch it to you. Hey, Luke, do you have a top five favorite Red Hot Chili Pepper songs in your personal library? I mean, five Red Hot Chili Pepper songs. I don't know if I can name five. Well, um, tell me your fandom of them. Like, get, at least give us a, a snapshot of your fandom of one of the better. Okay, rock so number one, there. easy for me. No, no, here, okay, you know what? Let me. I, I'm being a hater. That's not quite true. My number one is Easy BC, and I feel like are you a? Let me before I give you my answer. You know, you're a Chili Peppers fan, right? Yeah, more casual than hardcore, but definitely a fan, yes. Okay, so I mean, I feel like their best song by a country mile is Under the Bridge, yeah, right? Yeah. Which a, is the yeah. one where he yeah. talked about, uh, uh, Anthony Kiedis talked about heroin addiction and overcoming it and all that nonsense. Um, so that is definitely my number one go-to. Uh, the cover of uh, Stevie Wonder's Higher Ground, I'm kind of partial to a little bit. Um, what else am I in favor of, BC? Let me see. I, I would like say... The late the, the end of the night. So I was a big blood sugar sex magic, which was their first real sort of mainstream commercial album where they got a little bit away from being more just, you know, funk and other things. Um, But I love that big late nineties sort of, I don't know if you call it a comeback. Don't call it a comeback. If somebody has been here for years, but the whole Californication don't stop uh, scar tissue, that whole run of, of radio rock hits during a time, Luke, you will remember when radio rock was the shits, right? It was like Nickelback and, and, you know, all kinds of rap rock crossovers. They brought the good stuff during that run. They were rock and roll during that run. Yeah. And that was such a huge time for, I mean, that was really the peak of rock and roll. If you ask me, or at least it's last peak anyway. So I would say, okay, we've got, uh, I, I like Californication too, but you got under the bridge, breaking the girl, I would add higher ground. And I'm going to throw in, not that it's one of the better ones. I, I, I am not a Chili Peppers aficionado, BC, but I'll throw in Aeroplane. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. my Aeroplane, that one. I'll, Do you I'll also, wait, look, let's well. stay there. Do you also like your pleasure spiked with pain? <laughs> I certainly do. I certainly do, good sir. All right, you give me your top five. I don't think I have a top five. And, I, and the reason why I won't force one out is I want to I want to respect the band and say I'm a casual, I'm a radio listener, I'm a YouTube listener, I'm not an album listener. Then You know who's probably real mad listening to this is CBS Sports uh, combat editor Brandon Wise, our good friend, who's a hardcore. He's so hardcore, his wife once bought him what they thought was front row tickets to the Chili Peppers, Luke. Turns out it was a Chili Peppers cover band. So, uh, you know, that was a, that was probably a fun night out. That but, happened uh, to me. I was, dating, I was dating a girl, and she thought she got me tickets to see The Roots, but yeah. she actually got me tickets to see... Um, the Boots, uh, Who yeah. was the famous crooner, the woman, who sang At Last? At oh, last. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. Her, 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 her band is called The Roots Band. Like that's the uh, name, the Roots Band. Yeah. So I ended up seeing um, her, and she was drunk as shit, singing and like trying to twerk at like age seventy. Uh, it's not no, Eartha Kitt. No. Eartha Kitt was the black cat woman. Etta, her is name. it Etta James or something? I don't Etta know. Etta James. Etta James. Yeah. yeah. And Etta James in her prime was like the you know couldn't be topped. But yeah. you know at age nearly age eighty. Not the same show. Yeah, she's so. in her girdle. Yeah, I got it. I don't need that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Uh, Luke, so Brandon White's probably pissed off, but I'm going to say, like, remember when Vlad Klitschko in his, in his prime would come out to Can't Stop? That song's badass, right? See, I, I don't hate that song, but doesn't like TJ Dillashaw come out to it? It feels like a yeah, little bit a, like elevator music. I'm a day one ish Killashaw fan, so I'm fine with that. I love, yeah, whatever, but I'm not going to pretend to be hardcore. I'm a cash, so let's move you on. Say, you don't like Under the Bridge. Under the Bridge was Dude, like. 
it's their best song. It's it's fan yeah. friggin tastic. It's like the odd ballad from this funky fresh, you know, fusion band. Yes, they're friggin fantastic. Shout out to okay. um uh what's the the Rick Rubin who is a huge influence in their yes. career by the way. Yeah. And by the way, if by you way, are getting Flea when Flea discovered Cannibal Corpse on social media this year, it was a wonderful wonderful time. Wow. Uh by the way, loved Flea and Kiedis's cameo in Point Break with Swayze and uh yes. and Gary Busey. Flea's had a they, they Flea's had a bunch of cameos. Yes, yes. And also that jump shot he hit, and I think it was the third MTV Rock and Jock basketball game. He hit a big corner jump shot to like win it in the closing seconds. I was there. I, I'm not there, but you get what I'm saying there. All right, enough babbling. Enough babbling. All right, all right, BC. My, my turn. My turn to ask you. Ready? Here we go. Is Habib risking turning into an Icarus, which is to say, is coming back for the 30 0 record? And we're assuming that he does that at this point, just flying too close to the sun. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on here, Luke. Um, you know, he says we you know, remember in the show we were like, Well, I'm not gonna talk about him coming back for 30 you know until I hear it, until I hear it from you. Uh is that the Goo Goo doll? No, that's uh No, until I, I hear it from Jim Blossom I don't know. better than Ezra, one of them. It's one of them, yeah. Luke. Um Dishwalla. And no, that's that's uh, <laughs> tell me all your thoughts on God. Yeah, because I'd really like to see him. Yeah. Tell me if okay, I'm okay, okay. Right. Okay, um, okay, okay, okay. So about Luke, Habib? Um Habib came out and was like, No, 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 no. I'll I'll smash your opinion if you believe that. But then did you see he just put on social media this week? Like Dana White, I'll see you soon, boy. I don't know what's going on. I don't get the Icarus reference. Um he could walk away at perfection right now. Yet 30 and 0 would be a nice round number. There are two things I think he could do or should do, Luke. And one of them is not Conor McGregor because he's not motivated by money. So why do it, right? If he's not motivated mm. by the money from it, he doesn't want to reward this guy that he thinks is a POS. Either get GSP in some form, catch weight, just do it because your dad wanted you to. Or I said this before, I'll say it again. Specifically angle Tony Ferguson. He's got to beat Doe Bronx first, and that's a great ass fight. But say, look, this was the fight the fans always wanted. Five times was a charm. Nope. We're gonna go for the sixth time. And if I, you know, I'm gonna walk away at 30. I'm gonna put I'm gonna Ted Williams it. I'm not gonna, you know, I might be hitting 400 today, but I got there's one, there's a double header. I gotta play both games. All right. I'm gonna fight Tony Ferguson. I'll have huge respect for his daggy balls if he does that, okay. Yeah, those daggy balls are certainly like hibbity hops. I'm not really all that concerned about it, BC. This is not St. Pierre, you know, who, I mean, almost quite literally walked out of the octagon on his hands and knees after fighting Johnny Hendricks. And I thought Hendricks won that fight, whether you think he was on the sauce or not. You just asked me who, who I thought did the better work once the cage door was closed. You know, I thought it was Johnny Hendricks. But, you know, obviously St. Pierre got his hand raised. But, you know, his face was a mess at the press conference, he was on. A, he was in a shitty mood, hyping the fight because he was just burned out from the fight game. I mean, I get that Habib is probably feeling a lot of things about what he wants to do, and um, a lot of those are probably not centered on fighting. But BC, he's not declining. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> he's not like his game isn't suffering or something. So like I don't know if who you know I don't know exactly what's next. Is he going to bite off more than he can chew? But as long as he's fighting another man who's 155 pounds, I mean, my, my guy's got a shot to win, BC. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he does. He's going to be favored against Ed every single one. I mean, look, look, seriously, we said this when he originally beat Gaethje and said he's going to leave. If he leaves now, he will legitimately be leading at, at leaving at like the mountaintop, something that maybe only Jim Brown of the NFL did back in the day or whatever. Like, you know, even when Barry Sanders walked away, he had stuff left in the tank, but he was never going to be the same Barry Sanders. The key of that transaction was that if he would have hung around for a year and a half he could have broke the rushing record and he's like i don't care i'm gonna stand by my principles i respect people with conviction and in and, and core values and all that so it, it's on him whatever the hell he wants to do look he has nothing to prove to us nothing nothing at all wouldn't it be great to be in that spot where you got nothing to prove to anyone luke right my whole life has been just constantly trying to prove that i'm not an absolute piece of dog crap yeah i mean you know, how, how am i doing well, your family is a bunch of scholars and you're like, hey, I'm going to go into like MMA uh, breakdowns. Yeah. By the way, do you, what happened to the Dissected? You got a new spinoff franchise. What's going on here? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know if we can tell the whole story. Dissected is still going to be around. Did you make a Pat Tillman gonna... joke on an, on an episode of Dissected and you got it shut down by <laughs> Showtime Legal? Is that what happened? No, BC. I exercised more caution than that. <laughs> um, 
I just I, I I can't really talk about it, but I have to break them up. So yep. you'll get a little bit of both, but there you go. Technical difficulties right. and uh, dissected. And brosected. I like the name though. Well done. Technical difficulties. Thank you. All right, let's advance. Let's advance here, Luke. What do you got? What do you got? My yeah, turn. It's you. It's Europe. Yep. All right, Luke. Out of the following 2020 COVID standouts, not on this list though. Um, a lot of people had great COVIDs, right? Uh, Michael Jordan's last stand. Um, uh, uh. The damn tiger guy. Can you they, just ask the question? So they put him in the can. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Fauci. Fauci had a good year. Uh, but of these MMA really? fighters, Luke, who will have the best career of guys that had 2020 standouts? Your choices are Kamzat Chimaev, Jiri Prochatska, Prochatska, Jiri Prochatska. Yeah, John John Blackowitz. Um, no, uh, Kevin Holland or D. Mornier. Lazes. Lazes. Yeah. It's either so it Chimaev, won't be Lazes, Prochatka. although he's interesting. Who the, so the, the real Lazes? choices are Chimaev, Prohachka, and Holland. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. The obvious answer is supposed to be Chimaev, but honestly, man, like I'm not saying everything is a fraud. That's not it, for me to say the whole thing is a fraud and a setup, I have to know better. And I don't know better. But here's what I do know. He hasn't really proved a whole lot other than he's obviously good. But lots of people are good in the UFC. We don't really know how good he is. Um, now, we're going to find out when he faces Leon Edwards and he goes and he beats Leon Edwards. Okay, then at that point, you have definitive evidence. Beating Gerald Mearshart in the way he did was impressive and the other two donks. But those other two donks, I mean, they're not going to make it in the UFC much longer. Mearshart, um, you know, he's, I think, a competent, decent middleweight. Uh, I think he's got parts of his game that are actually quite good. But, you know, I didn't like the way he was approaching the fight. Uh, Jamayev has ability, but relative to the hype around him, he hasn't proven that. Prohachka is, to me, very interesting, and I think can make a run at 205. And Holland I like as well, but I think that there's a lot of hype behind him that he hasn't proven yet. So, which is to say, all three guys are very talented and will go far. I'm going to do the black horse option, P uh, BC. I'm going to go Prohachka. 205 is much wow. more of a wide open – yeah, it's a much more of a wide open division. Uh, it, then the other ones that Chim well, Chimaev at 185 might be a somewhat wide open, but 170, not really. And Kevin Holland, I like, but um, can you I don't know. Term, I just, can you use the term upper bound limits in this conversation at all? Well, yeah, well, here's the thing. The reason why this question is interesting is because you actually don't know the upper bound limit of any of them. If I may. And Prohachka yeah. to me has more known weaknesses, but he's competing, I think, at a space and time where it's more uh, available to advance. That's well, let's answer. just tell the truth here. I don't know who the guy D is. Does he fight for the UFC, Luke? Am I a filthy cash? Who the hell is Munir Lazez? Yeah, he does. He's, uh, I think he's Moroccan. Um, he had that war in his debut. I'll pull it up here in just a minute. But who uh, do you think? Holland looks really good, but I, I, I don't know if he has that, that, that uh, upper, that final gear, that, that spectacular gear to, uh, to get to beat the elites. And Prochatska is wild and dangerous, Luke, but I don't know if he's as well-rounded and technical enough to be great. I think it's got to be Chimaev, correct? Yeah. Uh, Chimaev, I think, is the other choice. By the yeah. way, uh, Munir Lazez had the back-and-forth war with Abdul Razak Al Hassan in, in uh, July at Fight Island. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. I, see, here's what happens. And let's be honest, Luke, this isn't, you know, this isn't nationalism or racism. Sometimes foreign people show up on the UFC screen, you watch them once, you're like, wow, that guy's kind of interesting. But it takes two to three fights before the name and the face and the fighting all comes together in your brain, right? Yeah, I think that's fair. Unless I mean, dude, Jan Blachowicz was that guy for like yeah. seven years, you know? Yeah, Johnny Blachowicz. Yeah, I know that guy. All right, all right. Yeah, Just team, team me up, Luke, here. Let's go. Let's... All right, here we go. Uh, which happens first, BC? You got three choices. Which happens first? A, UFC abandons the pay-per-view model, which I mean either means they go fully TV or something like WWE. B, the judging system is revamped. Or C, we see a fighter win a belt in three separate weight classes. What do you think? Wow. Um, okay. I'm tempted to say three. Let me try to talk myself out of saying three. It's not going to be B, Luke, because I think that just given the fact that each state has their own rules, which is so freaking stupid. 
MMA is like a professional sport right now. We have major league promoters, mid-level, small-level ones. And yet every state's like, no, in this state, you got to put your, if you have one knee and your package on the ground, you can keep, you can knee to the face. But in the other state, only one, like, it's just, it's BS. Okay. They're not figuring that out. Um, the first one could happen, but I think given that UFC still locked into the deal that they're in right now and it's profitable and, and, and I feel like they still thrive and need the traditional pay-per-view market. Now, WWE did go all into the streaming in 2014, right? They, they risked future money and they said it's going to be one price, no matter if it's WrestleMania or it's a, you know, payback or backlash or like a, the equivalent of like the last UFC pay-per-view we just saw, Luke, right? It's just like a complete mail-in most, you know, it's all the same price. And look, it's, it's worked to a degree, but you could argue if they'd gone the other way, or if they split that up. So I don't think we're going to get there yet. It's got to be C. So the answer, Luke, is, or the question off of the answer, is who will it be? Now, it could be Henry Cejudo, if they give him a chance. And somebody like Volkanovsky's the champ, who is smaller, and Cejudo goes out there and fights a great fight. It always could be somebody like Conor McGregor, if he goes in there against the right welterweight and knocks him out. Even though we've proved, I think he's proven to this point, Luke, and three welterweight fights, one against Cerrone that doesn't count, but two against a legitimate. Now, is Nate Diaz a legitimate welterweight or is he a blown up lightweight? He's a he's a blown up lightweight. Okay, but he didn't have knockout power in that. He had beat your ass power. He had cut you and knock you down power. He didn't have knockout power. But still, he could, he could potentially stop somebody. He's in this in- equation, but it's probably more likely to be an Israel Adesanya if he can go up there and in one fight mm-hmm. win the 205 title and then say, look, I'm going to do it. I'm going to F around. I used to kickbox it heavy, so I'm going to go up. And let's say John Jones is the champion. Let's say they have this epic fight. and not, is he, It's possible. It's in play, Luke. Is there anyone else we're not thinking of? I don't think Valentina can get down to 115. Is there anybody else we are not thinking of? Could Figueredo win at one? F- I mean, he hasn't won the bantamweight belt, but he obviously could make bantamweight and be competitive there. Yeah, but feather. Could he even mm, fight at one forty five? Could he do it? I don't think he could so do little. it. Little. He's so he's so small. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't. So yeah, the, your two clubhouse leaders, if he came back, would be Cejudo, uh, Connor, if he gets a welterweight title shot somehow, depending on the matchup, and then Adesanya. Those are your. Those and are your Kamzat best choices. Chimaev, I feel like. If Kamzat Chimaev lives up to his top end <laughs> billing, I guess he can win one in every weight class, right? Okay, there you go. I suppose that would be. Uh, uh, that would be one. All right, hit me with the next one. All right. Uh, this is Luke. It says, if Luke had... B- Wait, is this to me or you? I don't understand how the people write. Right. Is this me reading it to you? I guess so, right? Number five on our list here? Yeah, that's you have to read that. I just okay. read the last one. Okay, Luke. If Luke, meaning you, had been in A Few Good Men, the movie, would you okay. have given PFC William Santiago the code red if ordered to do so? Okay, so private first class, William Santiago. Would I have given the code red? Probably. Um, did you have you seen this movie? Like parts of it on HBO as a kid. I don't oh. remember the storyline. I remember the big moments, okay. of course. Look, you can't <laughs> handle here's the how fact. Here, here you can't how handle warped. the fact that I can't remember it. Okay, dude. Here's how warped the Marines are. The Marines are made in this movie by the people who made it to look like bullies who are just like ravenous about power and physical domination over each other. <laughs> Who are the Marines I know? It, you. Seems right. Seems yeah. about right. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, dude, if you talk to Marines about A Few Good Men, they're like, God, I love the Marines and how they're portrayed in this movie. It's like, you know they're they're being portrayed as bad guys, right? And they're like, yeah, but in the best way possible. So that's just something you have to understand. Listen, in my time in the Marine Corps, I saw an absolute fuck ton of hazing. But one of the reasons why this movie is terribly unrealistic is if you're a colonel in charge of Guantanamo Bay, you're not giving orders about individual low-level enlisted guys and who gets you know, hit, hit with the bar of soap in the sock or whatever. You don't make that call. They're way too busy. They barely even know. I mean, I, they, they, they couldn't name a one private in a fire squad if their, you know, their lives depended on it. That's going to come from somebody at the sergeant level, at the court, at the NCO level, or the staff NCO level. So that movie gets that really wrong. And have I seen hazing like that? Maybe not to that extent where they fucking kill a guy. No, but have I seen hazing uh, in the Marine Corps that came from some kind of order above, you know, from some kind of corporal or sergeant or staff sergeant? All the fucking time. All the fucking time. It's it is it was routine. I, it, it, you know, you see just all kinds of crazy shit in the field. 
Anyway, uh, but the second part of the question is, do you think Colonel Nathan Jessup, that was Jack Nicholson, I didn't was get correct there, in his... I didn't get no. there yet. I needed your All right, answer. Well, you said yes. William so said what yes. I have, would I have done it? I mean, I didn't... I, to be, you, you're, people are not going to believe me. I actually witnessed a shitload. I don't think I ever really took part in any hazing. But, like, if I had been ordered to do so, probably. Like, did yeah, you ever probably. see the show Oz? If they ordered you to do some of that kind of stuff, would you have done it? Yeah, but isn't it like, dude, like, rules in prison are different, man. Like, if someone's like, you got to stab a guy, or we're just going to stab you to death in the shower. <laughs> what do you... Like, what do you... <laughs> What are you going to do? I need you to rape this you man. You stab a dude. Luke. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. The second part. Do you think Colonel Nathan Jessup was correct in his you can't handle the truth speech? That must be Jack Nicholson. Was he correct I in mean, saying that? I don't know anymore. I used to think that there was some truth to it. But I grew up in the military when, you know, uh, gays could not openly serve and women couldn't be in combat billets. And all that has changed. And, you know. It's like that scene with Bill Murray in Ghostbusters BC, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. You always thought if those rules were broken, there would be mass hysteria, and there just wasn't. In other words, there was sort of like these ugliness to the way in which the military uh, combat arms conducted themselves that you thought was sort of like the secret ingredient in the sauce. If you'd asked me 20 years ago, I absolutely would have told you yes. I'm the now I'm not person. so sure. Okay. Um, in light of what you just said, do you think it's time that we remove the gender barriers on public restrooms? Well, they mostly have in the city uh, here Ooh. where I live. They're just wow, they just have impressive. that. Well, here here is the way to do this, which no one ever talks about is possible. The best way to do it is you have like if you can make it, you have a series of individual rooms that anybody can just use, yes. rather than like grouping everyone fifty to a room. And then people all get weird about who's doing what and who's not doing what. Rather, <laughs> just make it like, here, you got one stall, one person at a time, and everything else is, you know, it's wide open, right? Do it do it, do it, it that way and fucking be done with it. I, mean, I tend to think feel, it's not a big deal. Would you feel comfortable, like, post-Chipotle, 1 a.m., <laughs> just tearing, tearing, at, like, peeling paint off the walls, Luke, if there was, like, some respectable females in there? No, you wouldn't, Luke. You wouldn't. B.C., Today, I forgot to take a dump before doing deadlifts at the gym, oh, and I no. consistently <laughs> farted every audibly. Oh. I consistently farted every time oh. I tried to get into the, uh, oh. the position before the pull. That That's a true so story. Good. I kept farting. And you know what? I'm 41. I'm like, I don't even care anymore. Yeah, yeah. You don't, I don't you obviously know. All right. Please, please continue, Luke. All right. Uh, BC, thoughts on Dana White heavily encouraging finishes, and if this is fair... Because there have been recent cases where it has almost definitely affected fighters' performances. What do you think? Um, like in theory, no, it's not fair. Because in in when I say by encourage, I mean they encourage to the level that you're financially motivated to get finishes. You get bonuses. You get more opportunities if you're exciting. Now, look, you can argue and say even without that, like let's say boxing, where that's not there. Well, if you're a finisher, you still some in some ways get advantages promotionally why because people want to see finishes but dana white is obviously extreme in a purposeful way in that regard um so in some cases it's not fair because the goal in mma is to win the fight to win the championship and it's any way possible even if you are a john fitch or a point fighter or whatever luke but we've said this before when when, when this subject was brought up i mean it's dana white's sandbox you know you know the rules coming in like Leon Edwards might have to win 12 in a row before he gets a title shot. He knows that they, we know that that's what it is. That's where it's at right now. Okay. Two turntables, a microphone and the bald guy who makes the rules. So is it unfair? A little, but it's not like to the level where you are completely handcuffed and your career cannot advance and you whatever. I mean, look, it's, it's look, there's two games in, a, in the fight game because it's entertainment at the end of the day, right? It's not like high school sports. So there's the there's the game where you try to win, then there's the game where you can get more money by being popular. That you know, there's critical and there's commercial. The two values in this game, the commercial's up to you. If you fight and you get finishes, you're more likely to get commercialized. So it's part of the game anyway. Dana White just exploits it to a certain level to try to create a tone, and and, and it's 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 it works. Look, it's working. It's been working for a while. Okay, you know sort of. I mean, I'm not I'm not one of these guys that is on board with this idea that like. Oh man, they're firing everybody, and then they're substituting them with, um, 
contender series guys and we all know the story about contender series like you can win 30 seconds with a knockout and they'll sign you and reality is that's not really a great way to know who's going to be good and who's not but like you got to understand dana white's position here their the roster is swollen they do need to make some cuts that's the first thing i'd say second part is there's no regional mma or at least very very little they're going to be overly reliant on that show and the ultimate fighter as a way to recruit new fighters now that's not this this conversation is not totally about contender series it's also about just in general you know how they get performance bonuses and who seems to get the rub and blah 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 um yeah i mean listen if you're like, so this is what i mean like if you're a promoter what is it you think the promoter wants like and what is it you think the promoter is going to do like is is dana white breaking any laws by structuring the business the way that he has now you can maybe make a case that down the line if this if this court case proceeds, that we'll discover that they have. But to this point, as I speak to you now, has it been determined by any regulatory body or any court of law or any other uh, uh, entity that could sort of adjudicate these matters that they've broken any law? No, nothing. They've broken no laws. So this is just going to be the way that it is to a degree. I don't know how healthy it is for the sport to fetishize it quite the way that he has. But I also don't think it's the sky is falling either, to be quite honest with you. We just had a, a pay-per-view where Brian and I debated, you know, whether or not the co-main event was kind of fucking boring. Uh, and that's like the best person in that weight class. So in the end, there'll be a series of incentives that guide behavior. The promoter, you know, unless he changes the rules, the promoter figuring out a way to incentivize finishes, I, I don't think is necessarily all that big a deal. Uh, so do you think this debate is akin to, let's say, if you own a business and you're hiring somebody to work the door, a secretary, a cashier in the front, whatever, and you may have somebody who's fantastic at their job, but they look kind of gross and they stink and they're rude <laughs> to people and you want somebody that better represents your brand. So you hire the good looking younger person who's nicer to the people and makes them feel like they want to come back. Dude, dude, not- this is the way the world works. You know who likes pretty women? BC, everybody, everybody does. Why do you think that they are in charge of the door at the most expensive and you know exclusive New York City clubs? These are not clubs I care to get into. I don't give a shit. But if you've ever been and tried to get into a really nice club in Manhattan, you've got a gorilla of a guy who's working security and the That's person you. who is inspecting everybody else is a woman and she's absolutely fucking ruthless and she's probably an eight or a nine out of 10 on everybody's scale this is just the way that it goes is it fair fuck no is it right of course not it is just the way the world works you want to make things easier on yourself hire attractive people to make those and those goals get to where you want it to go and and uh and yeah it's you know it it fucking blows but you know i mean people could well pretty people get (laughs) special treatment bc yeah you think you think that's well, true? In the UFC, the pretty people are the people that bang and get knockouts, Luke. It is what it is, okay? Up I don't to a point, though. Even then, though, like, even then, that's not totally true, which is why the argument is a little bit overstated. If you can win and, you know, on occasion have a nice... Uh, I mean, look, Valentina Shevchenko has had almost twice as many decisions as she's had finishes, and they revere her and promote her like she's the fucking Terminator. It's just not true. You have to always go out and do that. Now, do you have to have the occasional jessica i or juliana pena moment in your career yeah you probably should you can't just have nothing but john fitch moments but if you can balance it out even a little bit and you can win dude you you can go pretty far with it it just helps if you're attractive or you have an attractive fight style or you know some other thing that you can hang your hat on luke if you had been in a coma for the past 10 years but still held the same level of ufc and mma fandom that you do and you re-emerged just in time for saturday's pay-per-view last week and i told you hey look there's jennifer maya in the main event you're like who's that and i told you she's either damian maya's daughter or wife which would you have believed more wife okay all right uh all right bc i'm not sure we have to i have to explain this one I think um, I have to read it to you, Luke. I think that's how the rules work, okay? Oh, yes. So, sorry. Go ahead. So, Luke, this viewer is saying, thank you for the rights in perpetuity answer about why is music dubbed 14 to 21 days post-event. Can you just give me a refresher on what that means, Luke? If you watch a pay-per-view live and you hear everyone's walkout music, like Caitlin Chukagan comes out to DMX, Where the Hood At?, if you wait a year or two or something and then you go on Fight Pass and you listen for her walkout, 
um, it, the chances are you won't. You'll hear some other kind of music that is sort of like, you know, whatever UFC owns, like their own in-house music Makes sense, dubbed yeah. over it. WWE and the reason why is because you can buy the yeah. rights for a certain amount of time, uh, but they tend to not buy them in perpetuity. Yeah, and if you want to know the rest, hey, buy the rights. How bizarre, right, Luke? You know what I'm saying? So, Luke, why is UFC 217, 226, 229 subject to this rule, but not 227 and 249? And if everybody knows rights in perpetuity, then why don't fighters walk out to something that does not fall subject to RIP? Uh, that's an interesting question, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know the answer to why 227 and 249 is the way that this person describes it. I, I honestly don't know. Um, but the, the question to answer the question about like why don't they do it to something that's not that way, well, for one, they don't really have control over it. It's the UFC as a broadcast entity that has to purchase these rights. Um, so you'd have to... Have, find a way to work that through UFC. Now you could say, well, what about just using your own music? Rampage had his own rap song for a time or something like that. Maybe that's a way to work around to BC, but you know as well as I do, when fighters come out to songs that they had a rapper or you know rocker friend to write for them, those songs tend to suck balls. <laughs> Luke, what song in the UFC is most identified by one fighter? It doesn't have to be your favorite song, the best song. What song is like where you hear the song, you think of that fighter instantly uh there's probably a couple one uh biggie um kick in the door who comes out to that who are you, who are you talking about here? uh frankie edgar uh, 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 yes yes uh, yes, yes. Uh, that one yep um your rain on the top was short like leprechauns that one uh so that's one i would Did say you, back in the pride it? days the, yeah, the, we'll the rude st one. sandstorm one was big um Oh, Matt Hughes, Country Boy Can't Survive is big. Yes. yes. Uh, when when I hear that, uh, what's that Chael Sonnen song it comes out that to, comes out for? Uh, the country some honky tonk song. <laughs> the dangity dangity. Worst uh, fucking entrance music ever. I love ever. that shit. The beginning, it's like, it's so, it just catches you off guard that you're like, what? Yeah. What is that song? Dude, what that is shit, like, you know, Chael, it's, uh, dude, it's amazing that Chael would come out to that music. Because he understood the business of promotion early in that era in ways that, and Stephen to this day, most fun, of his bro. contemporaries never did. How did you not have an iconic walkout song? How did you come out to some song about a honky tonk in Tennessee? <laughs> it's a awful. Too, too much fun by Daryl Singletary. Yeah, yeah. Too much fun. What's that shit? Yeah. What? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, who who the fuck sings that as like you know an anthem? And you can't even say, oh, it's because you don't like country. Country Boy Can't Survive, Hank Williams Jr. I mean, you know, it's exactly what we're talking about. You can do it if the shit works. Yeah. But if it doesn't, you know, you, know, you fuck <coughs> off. Uh, Ronda Rousey's, um, you know, bad reputation oh. was pretty big. R very iconic and identified with just her. I'm not good at this. I'm trying to think of famous fighters, and I'm like, I have no idea what their song is. What was Chuck uh, Liddell's? When Lesnar no came out to uh, Enter Sandman, that was kind of big. Yeah. What was Liddell's? Do we know? Uh, he had a DMX song. And so did um, Anderson Yeah, Trova. no. Yeah, L Liddell with the yes, that was um uh which song was it? It was uh Come Through, Run Through, that one, right? Yeah, I think so. Where my dog well, have, you listened, have you ever listened to like where the hood at? The <laughs> lyrics are insanely homophobic. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that's most of uh yeah, that's most <laughs> all right, yeah, that's great. Uh Luke, let's let's roll on here. You got the next all one. Right. All right, BC. Have you guys ever watched the comedy store doc? doc like the documentary on showtime also have you guys ever been there bc what uh, do you think? no and no but I, I i do enjoy showtime docs outside of trying to pump it because uh they're the label that pays me and i will check it out right now i'm into that doc series luke real quick uh rick rubin you know the famous music producer i referenced him earlier he has the shangri-la documentary series on showtime which just basically has like bands coming into his famous studio and he works with them. It's just very interesting. Have not seen the comedy store. How about yourself? Uh, I have not seen this one, but I have seen, um, it came out, I want to say 2002 ish. So there was a documentary called comedian and it followed two comedians. It followed the return of Jerry Seinfeld after the end of his show back to stand up, and he, you know, sort of working through the scene again and, she tried to, you know, uh, shake off the rust. He had a little bit there. And then this other comedian who'd sort of been in the trenches and was trying to make a name, Orny Adams. And um, that 
there was a lot of scenes there that took place at what's called the Comedy Cellar in New York City. The Comedy Cellar is probably what the com- it's not the it's not the one that does the biggest shows in in New York BC, but it's like all the comedians comedians know that that's the place that you go to to really get uh, at least it was back in the aughts as like the place that the best comedians in the city would go to night after night. So I went there so often that you would see com- like very, very, very famous comedians pop in and they would bump everyone else in line that night and just do a set. So I saw Dave Chappelle come in one time and do an hour long set that was un- unrehearsed, unscheduled. Wow. I saw Seinfeld come in. So I saw Seinfeld from me to this camera. Uh, he-, he came in. Chris Chris Rock came in and did a set. Um I saw Patrice O'Neill there. I saw Patrice O'Neill nearly fist fight a heckler there. I mean, I have uh, Dave Attell, all those guys I saw come in and do just phenomenal. Jim Norton was all the time there. Uh, Nick DiPaolo, um, you know, that was just an unbelievable place. So I I, I have a lot of great memories of that. It's probably pretty similar to because the because the comedy store is the L.A. version, basically, of the comedy cellar on the on the East Coast. So the comedy store is the one with Mitzi. Yeah, mm-hmm. is that Paulie Shore's mom? I think I—I I don't know. It might be, but uh, but you know, it's a sort of an iconic West Coast club, like CBGBs or something. But you think? But for you comedy, think, uh, Brendan has played the the uh, the the store. Dude, he's played there a million times. I think. I'm sure he slayed, bro. I'm sure he slayed afterwards backstage too. Shout out to Brendan Chubb. All right, uh, Luke, have you ever seen the Rat Catcher documentary on on Netflix? No. What is that? Is that the, or no? The Fox Catcher. Sorry, Fox Catcher one. Oh. <laughs> Uh, what was that that dirtbag's name? The uh, the rich guy. What was his name? John Dupont. Do you ever worry that while we laugh and have fun with this, that Jay is very Dupontian, and that we're gonna have a Schultz brother type exit from the show, Luke? Well, John Dupont was at least successful for having money. Aaron <laughs> is not. Um, he, so... drives, he drives a pretty nice car. All right, I'll give him. Yeah. All right, here's the thing though. He took a fucking beating in that documentary. <laughs> I hope he's okay with that. <laughs> And that's I think why, the people loved it. That's why I'm wondering if uh if we if we should move off the farm right now. Like, okay. <laughs> Kurt Angle, by the way. So. Kurt Angle was smart. He got the hell off of that farm. All right. Yeah. All right. Hey, all Luke, right, uh, here's a question from the viewers. Um, when's the politics coming back? Watching these fools have breakdowns in the live chat is a priceless experience. So what they're asking you, Luke is why are you not interjecting more politics into these shows just to troll the audience? Well, here's the thing. I mean, the, what always is so funny about the live chat is whenever I talk about politics, which is you know relative to the amount of talking that happens per episode, um, it's not my call. I put up the thread ahead of time. I mean, I could, I, I could always ignore the questions. That part is true. But if I'm being faithful to the questions as they're laid out before me and how the audience selected them, because remember... I set it up where you know it's ranked. It's ranked essentially. So if you like it, it shoots to the top. You know if you get enough of them, it's like y'all wrote the questions and y'all selected which ones you thought deserved to be answered more than the other ones. So whenever I hear like complaints about it, I'm always like, okay, then vote it, then downvote it. You know what do you want me to do? That's the first part I'd say. The second part is, um, listen, I don't ever expect people when I'm done making any kind of political point in the live chat to necessarily agree with me, but I do think that inside of MMA. There is a obscene amount of groupthink and not nearly enough uh, diversity of um, of thought. Whether that's true about MMA itself, like you know how to fix judging. You know, I put out this video being like there should be two judges, one or two referees, one inside the cage and one outside. And here's how the one outside should be empowered. I had everyone and their brother telling me that was the stupidest idea. The next week, I got phone calls from two different commissioners at major commissions telling me they love the idea. You know what I mean? And then now you see Nevada. I don't know if they barred it for me. I, I suspect that they didn't. But that this, you know, breathing new life into things and taking ch- uh, um, uh, taking chances with ideas. Yeah, sometimes you're going to say probably stupid things, but more often than not, you might at least be on to something, or you might have an outright great idea. But you know, diversifying the kind of thought that takes place in MMA, I think, is extremely important because everyone kind of either wants to agree with agree with each other or not take too many um, steps outside of an acceptable Overton window. As it relates to politics, I think that's especially true. Everyone inside the sport is either sort of tuned out to the kind of thing or is decidedly right wing. And I'm not here to say that any of those positions are right and that I've got it all figured out far from it, but you're probably going to be better off in the end. And this includes me as well, hearing from people who I don't agree with, hearing viewpoints that 
force you to check the premises of your own that may challenge your own or that you hear and you just decide you know it's wrong because it's something you really looked into, fine. But diversity of thought, I, I'm always told that the right hates academia because there's not enough diversity of thought. Well, here I am reversing the process and trying to do the same thing on the other side. And there are, by the way, to be clear, there's a lot of people who are very receptive to it, even when they write me and tell me they don't agree. Okay, fine. You don't have to agree. But I think if you're open to the idea that um, diversity of thought uh, matters, whether it's right or it's wrong, you know, ha ha having a conniption fit about it tells me that what you're really not interested in is diversity at all. You're just interested in having your worldview repeated back to you in very comforting ways. And that's intellectually lazy and a little bit pathetic. Oh, all right. That was pretty deep. So are you willing to understand then at least that uh, George Bush's brother was on the board of directors for the uh, WTC security <laughs> staff or no? I mean, Didn't we look into this and it was like <laughs> only like 10% true of all the claims uh, you made uh, that you night? Know, so you're, you're saying there's a chance, Luke. All right. Uh, what, else, what else we got here, Luke? Let's all right. Last it, but right? not least, BC, this one goes to you, good sir. If you could bring, or they, they, I don't know if our producer wrote this like a three-year-old, but I'll have to translate it from this gobbledygook pigeon English. If you could, <laughs> do you, BC, do you ever see how like reflexively shitty I am to people? Like it, it doesn't, it does not take much effort. Yeah. It does not take much effort. Uh, okay, back to it. If you could bring to dinner any three combat sports figures, dead or alive. Who would they be? They could be coaches, fighters, famous cornermen, just notable figures right, inside the strategy. sport. If to, let's really do this question the right way. Are we thinking it in terms of chemistry too? Because if I've got Ali and McGregor at the same table, that could really, you know, that could really speed up the enjoyment. Nah, that's the just process. fireworks for nothing. Is that what you want to waste it on? Meanwhile, meanwhile it looks like I already got it. I had it already. It's Behrman. It's uh, Volkanovsky and uh, Kai Kata France. All right, it's fantastic. All right, yeah. Ooh, ooh, all right. Um, uh, what do you think? What do you who? Get, you can have the first draft pick off the board. Who you take? Who you having dinner with? I mean, okay. Let's posit something. Are we assuming that they're going to be truthful, or are we just taking them as they am? Fighters are truthful. I I've had situations in larger, you know, media dinners where you get food and a couple of drinks, and there's a famous fighter sitting across. That they're truthful, Luke. Okay, especially when they're retired, they don't give a damn. So if they're gonna be if they're gonna be into the process of having a conversation, I mean, you got to go Dana White, right? Don't you? Oh, he would. Don't but you? He would, but he uh, but he would commandeer and own the conversation because he's a. Look, he's a professional spinster, right? He controls the narrative, Luke. Yeah, he's but also, just cut his mic like the second debate or like the Oscars when you go I on too long, like is, the microphone just sinks. He is entertaining, though. Uh, when I worked at ESPN as an MMA editor, uh, he came in a couple times and we, you know, we got to sit down with him for an hour, not in an interview, just in like a let's talk how we can better, you know, promote the sport. And he, I mean, look, he holds court. He's an interview. He's an interesting dude to. Uh, I'm sure if we raise drinks to him, Luke, you may end up changing your opinion. You may go red at the end. Luke. I'm the one inviting him. You may, you know, yeah, you would. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You and Rhonda. Well, Dana would be one, one, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Look, that's a good call. Dana, Dana's not, Dana's there. That's a great call. Um, I mean, should we shoot for the stars? I mean, is there going to be a better person there than Mike Tyson to entertain you? Is there, is there going to be a better person there? Luke? No, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, and then, whew, man, um, don't say Pearl <sighs> Gonzalez. <laughs> no, I was thinking more cuss D'Amato, but okay. I mean, that's another way you could go. Uh, probably the same size. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> wow. Wow. Luke. Wow. <laughs> nobody, nobody uh, watches this deep into the show. Um, no. yeah. Uh, I mean, Michael Bisping would be great, right? Yeah, would he, he would be. I mean, th mean? only three is like, you got to have kind of a Last Supper deal where you just have I like mean, a bunch of them. You want to hear, okay, here's what you want out of this, okay? You want to hear great stories, right? You want to hear stuff you've never heard before. You want to hear Mia St. John. <laughs> uh, you want to do that. Uh, you want to be entertained. Asa Akira. Yeah. <laughs> just, let's just bring Rocco, okay? Let's, let's just, let's just end it, all right? Can we just watch him eat? No. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, look, can we go wrong here, Luke? I mean, how okay? Mike Tyson, Dana White, and Conor McGregor. That'd be a fun. That'd be a fun. Situation. Actually, Lorenzo. Lorenzo would be a guy that I would like to, over an extended period, right? Eating some pasta, maybe at the Red Rock Canyon Casino that he owns, and just hearing the story. Yeah, that'd be pretty interesting, right? And like, I had hearing... a friendly conversation with him at the. Um... Were you at the presser when UFC announced that, you know, they, the whole uh, NY, NY legalization thing no. and they had Governor Cuomo there signing it in the whole nine yards? Do you remember that? I, was, I remember it. I was not there, though. No. So I was there and I had a conversation with Lorenzo uh, in person after the fact. And Did you talk I about found him to gain? be. Did you talk gains and striations, Luke? Well, here's the thing. He is built like a brick shit house, but he is very short. He's shorter than Joe Rogan. He's short. Uh, he must be like five seven or something, five eight, something like that. He's not tall. Why would you bring um, up your tie? I don't get that. But go ahead, keep going. I'm just, I, I, you know, I mean, I put out a picture. I mean, next to me just recently, everyone was like, "Man, you're fucking short." Um, He's not tall. So Lorenzo's yeah, a yeah. good call. I might sub out. I might sub out Dana for Lorenzo. Keep Mike Tyson. Would well, you bring Don is, King? I mean, I don't know. No, nah, he's a dirtbag. The only problem with picking obvious ones like dana connor whatever is like they're so overexposed as well right it would almost be yeah. cool to have somebody you know i mean i don't know how far you want to go down the list but you know uh would it suck to have joe lewis or jack johnson oh. or somebody like that you know i mean it would yeah, be yeah jack johnson yeah exactly you know what jeff blatnick might be a great one as yeah. well yeah. rest in peace to jeff blatnick joe san maybe yeah just uh <laughs> Hey, remember when you uh, killed a guy in prison and went to prison for rape, you yeah. fucking animal? God, yeah. Wow. Nin ninja chop. Ju ju judo chop. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Mostly, I don't like talking to anybody, so it's a hard question for me to answer, BC. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'd have Shab, Hoppa, and Rhonda. How about that? That wouldn't be awkward at all. Hoppa? Uh, All right. Okay, I think we're done, right? That's it. We're done. We're done, Luke. Okay, this was fun. It was a holiday treat. Okay, I've got life things, important life things to do. Okay, so do I. Uh, well, BC, let, let's just remind everybody: like the video, hit that subscribe button, and and you know what? On this Thanksgiving Friday, share this around or share the documentary around. Isn't that fair? I think that's pretty fair, that's right? Fair. That's fair. And and pass the stuffing, the Scotty Pippen of the Thanksgiving meal, Luke. Well, you have, you, yeah, you you had stuffing, yeah, you did, you did. Yeah. Oh, I don't. Oh, yeah. We're still trying to figure out what to cook, but by the time you watch this, yes, I'll you'll, you'll have stuffing. cooked it already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Hey, well, oh, BC, uh, happy Thanksgiving to your family and to uh, thank you. our MK family here, who makes all this possible. Thank you, and Web Scream too. And Web Scream too. All right, you want to take us out? <laughs> uh, seriously, we we you know let's have fun, but we're giving thanks. I love all of you people. Okay, we can't do weird docs without you actually enjoying it. And uh, thank you for your patronage. Thank you for buying the merch. And oh, by the way, uh, there's still time for Black Friday sale of the merch. Okay, so go on to uh, store.show.com. There's a I know Luke doesn't check his email, but there's actually a Black Friday deal. Luke. They told us after the show on Monday, there actually is a Black Friday deal. So yeah. check our Twitter feeds today. You'll see it. And uh, yeah, thank you to everybody. And um, that's it, Luke. Uh, I'm Brian Campbell. That's Luke Thomas. We are Morning Combat. So um, I've got two words for you. We out.